Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, SANS 2024 Threat Hunting Survey, Hunting for Normal Within Chaos, sponsored by Carbon Black, Cisco, CoreLight, Cyborg Security, Hyas, Lacework, Rapid7, and Splunk. My name is Mary Lynn Gallier of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Matt Fuchs, SANS Certified Instructor and Author. Josh Lemon, SANS Certified Instructor and Author. John Gamble, Senior Director of Product Marketing at CoreLight. Adam Lopez, Director of Solutions Engineering at Hyas. And David Bianco, Staff Security Strategist at Splunk. If during the webcast, you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the Slack workspace or Zoom Q&A window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our presenters. Thank you very much, Marilyn, and good morning or good evening or, or uh, good very early morning, depending on where you are in uh, the different parts of the world. Uh, and, and if you're actually watching this back uh, after it's uh, been run live, thank you very much for, for watching it back. And, and we appreciate you kind of spending some time and, and listening through it today. Uh, as Mary Lynn mentioned, you have uh, Matt Fuchs and myself uh, this morning just to start off a little bit and talk a little bit about the threat hunting survey and the results that we saw this year. Uh, feel free to, to uh, drop questions in the discussion channel inside of Slack. I just had the, the Slack link up on screen, uh, which I'll put back up there again for all of you. So feel free to drop questions in there for either myself or Matt and also our other presenters as well that will be coming on shortly also. Remember, we do have a panel session at the end, so we'll take what you've put in that discussion uh, channel, and then we'll also discuss that amongst the, the rest of our panelists and, and then kind of open that up for a bit of discussion as well. Just a reminder, if you are using Slack today, please remember to be respectful of everyone uh, in Slack, it's it's important that it is an informative discussion and a and a, uh, a very sort of I guess sort of practical and useful discussion around what we're sort of talking about today. Uh, but the one thing we do ask from uh, a SANS point of view is that you're respectful of everyone's views inside of there, um, so that it acts as a a useful forum for us to discuss uh, interesting concepts and interesting ideas that might affect our industry at large, uh, so that we can kind of all learn from that and, and grow from that as well. All right, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Matt a little bit to, to give a little bit of an intro around what we're going to do today and, and start to kick this off. And then I'll come back and chat with all of you as well. Thank you very much, Josh. I know it's very hard for you very late at night. That's always hard <laughs> when you're down under, right? <laughs> it is a little bit. It is, we have a very it is hard a little... combination for the threat hunting, sir. <laughs> yeah, it is a little early in the morning for me for the folks <laughs> listening in. <laughs> I think uh, we've just gone past one thirty in the morning, which is a, a lovely hour. So, uh, so I'll, <laughs> I've got a, a good cup of tea here to kind of keep me going. Okay, yeah. So, um, like Josh already pointed out, um, we're gonna go through the results of the survey or some key points of the results. It's a little bit longer um, that um, that survey, so we can't discuss everything in the thirty minutes. Um, then Sean Gamble will talk about um, expanding visibility, as we know from the last few years when we did this threat hunting survey. Visibility is one of the the core things that we need uh, for threat hunting as well as for incident response. If we can see it, we can really fight it. Uh, that's important. Then we look um, a little bit into threat hunting techniques uh, with Adam Lopez, particularly um, about adversary infrastructure, and uh, Dave Bianco. Uh, We'll talk about um, hunting uh, and hunting frameworks that help you to organize your threat hunts. So I'm really looking forward to, to these talks too. Could you advance the slides, Josh, please? Josh is in control today. So looking at the demographics, uh, the, the point that is very interesting for us is not necessarily only which industries people are in. So we're looking for a global stretch of our respondents. That's important because 
uh, obviously from an attacker perspective, um, the global attacks are similar to a point. So there's not so much deviation in, in the ways that we should work. The other thing that we're interested in that we get the two angles of, an, of a threat hunting operation, which is on one at the technical part, and on the other hand, the management part, uh, basically the people who decide if threat hunting is worth anything, the people who decide if they're gonna spend money on it in the future, if they buy us our new tools that, that make a lot of fun. And then again, we are also looking into sizes, into the organizational sizes, because um, there is no one size fit, uh, no 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 one solution fits it all, right? A small organization might have other opportunities in how they do their threat hunts than large organizations that are multinationals, where the networks are usually getting a little bit more complex, which makes visibility in turn more complex. And and so I think we do have a quite good mix again this week, uh, this year. We have um, uh, a lot of industries that we're interested in. We have those high tech industries. Uh, we do have a good mix of geographies. So uh, we have all, all the continents, at least the ones that are not super cold. So Antarctica is still something we're missing. We're working on that for next year, maybe. Uh, we have all the organization sizes across. Um, and we do have, when you look at the top four roles that are represented, Number one is clearly security administrators and analysts, but uh, and number two, we already have business managers. So that should ensure that we do see both sides of this coin. We see the technical side and we see uh, the management side as well. So let's see what the key takeaways are that we got out of the information that you sent to us. Yeah, so, so this year, some interesting takeaways that we found in a lot of the, the survey results that came back uh, were here. I'm going to quickly run through some of these, but I do encourage you to, to get a hold of the actual paper itself. It's published and it's live online at the moment. So you can actually read through why uh, some of these were kind of key findings rather than also just seeing the stats behind it. One of the interesting things we asked this year was around what is the kind of most common threat actor that we that we have threat hunters find in the, the past year. And the most common one came out as BEC type threat actors with 68% identifying that as the most common uh, threat actor. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, or Matt will talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. But it's kind of an interesting thing to see what is it that people are actually catching when they go uh, looking for threats inside their environment. We also saw half of our organisations have formally defined threat hunting methodologies. Uh, again, we'll kind of look at uh, some of the summary results for this as well as we kind of talk through the, the overview this morning. But this is a significant increase, which is which is really wonderful to see, and also kind of reinforces that organisations are starting to formalise and and build these repeatable processes as well. We again looked at organisations that utilise. Uh, outsourcing for threat hunting. It's kind of an interesting question we, that we ask around this because it helps us understand a little bit about our organizations using their internal staff who we would sort of expect to really know the environment well, or our organizations having to outsource threat hunting because they either don't have the skills or they don't have the staff or they just don't have the time to actually go through that. And again, we'll look at some of that uh, this morning and, and also how that has changed a little bit over time as well. Uh, we're seeing 51% of organizations have developed clearly defined methodologies, which is uh, really good. We're seeing 64% of organizations starting to formally measure the success of effectiveness as well. Again, a, a nice kind of increase. And we kind of have started to see things like the adoption of, of methodologies and, and use of methodologies as that increases also, so does this sort of ability to be able to formally measure success, which makes sense. If we've got a repeatable process, it becomes a lot easier to actually measure that. We're also uh, seeing almost half, we're seeing 47% of organizations basically be influenced by what resources from a, from a human perspective they actually have to go and do threat hunting. And that is starting to influence the methodologies that they're actually using for threat hunting as well. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense practically when you think about it. If you don't have people to implement the, the methodology, then of course there's no kind of point writing that methodology. But on the on the other side of that, um, I guess sort of coin is that you often wanna write a, a kind of robust methodology for threat hunting and then kind of, and then try to see what you have available to kind of meet that methodology uh, as opposed to kind of, kind of getting a methodology that is influenced by resources or whether it be human or whether it be technical inside the environment. 
We are also uh, asked a couple of questions this year around where organisations collect threat intelligence from. Now, this is, I mean, this survey is not a threat intelligence survey, it's around threat hunting, but to be able to effectively threat hunt, you need useful threat intelligence to influence what you might go looking for in the environment or, or things that you want to try to find or, or how you might build a scenario that you wanna go and look for. So essentially, if you're looking for um, a threat actor that is doing things like altering forwarding rules in email, which would be kind of typical of BEC, what threat intelligence is there that exists around the ways that threat actors are doing that? And then how do I go looking for that in the environment? So, so threat intelligence forms a, a really kind of important part to threat hunting because without useful threat intelligence or threat intelligence that's relevant to our organization, it kind of makes it hard to go and, and perform sort of a, I guess, sort of that narrow threat hunt to go looking for threat actors that, that might really be relevant to your organization. So we, we asked some questions around this, around sort of where people are getting threat intelligence from or how they are developing threat intelligence. Uh, and this is where this kind of stat comes from in terms of 30% of respondents are using vendor information as a bit of fallback to their own threat intelligence that they might be developing internally. And then also we see 14%, which is pretty low in the, the grand scheme of the organizations that responded, but 14% are relying entirely on vendor threat intelligence. And the reason that, that Matt and I kind of find that interesting is because the best threat intelligence that you can kind of have is threat intelligence from existing incidents inside your organization. And when you start to use, I guess, sort of vendor threat intelligence, which can still be really useful, it can start to be more generic to other organizations because that obviously is threat intelligence from other incidents that have occurred in other organizations. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting um, little statistic to see how that's kind of worked. The other part too that we asked about is around who is contributing to threat hunting and, and who is contributing to the development of threat hunting as well. And it's nice that we're seeing incident response teams are starting to get a larger contribution to the threat hunting methodologies. Um, so we're seeing that slowly start to increase uh, from what it was last year. So about 32% of organizations are using the threat, the incident response team to kind of contribute to those threat hunting methodologies. Uh, again, why this is important is because the best threat hunting is usually influenced by the best threat intelligence and your incident responders, which are at the cold face of dealing with active threats inside the environment, can obviously provide really useful contributions to, to your organization to develop that methodology. All right, with that, let's dive into to some of the detail before I get too carried away and, and talk about all of these in, in one slide. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand over to Matt, who's going to talk through a little bit around um, how we hunt and, and what we find. Yeah, that's always a, a very difficult topic because one thing is how we hunt and how that affects what we find, because those things obviously affect each other, right? And the third thing is what happens in reality. Those things also don't need to match fully all the time, right? But the first concerning thing that I actually see in there, the first question that I would have when I look at the numbers is basically we see um, in position number one, business email compromise, and in position number two, ransomware. And both of those things are kind of attacks that also have the ability to, well, basically inform the company that that hack happened without setting off any security alerts. Mm -hmm. So for instance, ransomware is, is something that doesn't try to be undetected, at least when it fires, right? Then they want to be detected. I mean, sometimes we today have ransomware incidents where they mainly exfiltrate data and only encrypt a few machines just to make the company aware of their presence, right? Rather than encrypting uh, large amounts of machines because they know our companies have good backups now. Uh, so the encryption part is not really threatening. So the exfiltration part is the thing they, they're going to go for. Business email compromise, same thing. You could have a lot of detections going off on the financial side of the companies. So when you lose money because they are kind of interjecting into that money flow, you know, by sending out wrong IBANs and stuff, th those are also things that you that you detect eventually. So both of those uh, threat actors that, that run those schemes, uh -huh. they will be detected eventually anyhow, right? Without cybersecurity whatsoever, because that is based on what they do. Uh, so the question is, um, if the detection rate is that high, because they get detected that easily early on, 
or if it's that high because, well, you detect them anyhow, because if you yeah. can't work because everything is down in your company, well, that's, I would call it detection too. It's just not the intended way to detect them, right? It's detection, security detection by availability management pretty much, which is by the way, something that happens very often that availability management catches something before security operations catches them. The other thing here is also we have different components as most organizations or a huge number of organizations moved into the cloud. And that makes business email compromise also a cloud problem to some point. And that also influences how we can hunt there. And that is going back to the question how we hunt. Because while we can do quite a lot of things in your, in your local network, uh, you can control whatever you want, right? In the cloud, it falls back on what the vendor gives to you. And uh, one of one of the interesting points there that we could see uh, pretty much by the end of last year was when Microsoft announced the breach. Uh, one of the reaction was that they increased the time, the retention time for their locks and the, the depth of, of their locks that they would provide to their clients, which kind of shows you how dependent you are on those locks. The good news regarding that is um, for uh, Microsoft 365, which is, well, probably having the biggest market share in, in office applications um, out there and in, in hosted uh, exchange um, applications, uh, they do offer you quite some useful APIs. They offer you quite some useful locks to investigate those business email compromises and to also hunt for them and thirdly, to also prevent them. So hunting in business email compromises for business email compromises is good. But on the other hand, um, the, the turnaround time for business email compromises is oftentimes very short. We're talking about days or weeks until there is damage. Same for ransomware, right? And that is that is kind of a problem for hunting operations, especially you know if you only hunt every now and then a couple of times a year, you might not spot that at all, right? We did have some some breaches in 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 my teams last year where attackers were in a network for or in the mailboxes for a very long time. And they didn't do any harm in that time, didn't succeed. Well, then you can kick them out, but very often it's just too late. And that brings me down to the lower numbers here. <clears throat> and that is uh, where I totally like to see numbers like 38%. So that we see 38% in the in the nation state department there, because those attackers are different than the other two. They intend to, to stay stealthy for a long time, right? So that's very different. Um, and that means that is where threat hunting can also give you quite um quite a huge um a chance to catch them because when they are there they are there for long the same thing goes for criminal and industri uh, criminal industrial espionage and all the things that are in between right so today we also see a lot of organizations nation state organizations that are in the criminal industrial espionage part rather than anything else so when you think about north korea and so on they're a nation state but they act like criminals very often in, in that regard so those things, those borders, I mean, they mix up very well. And <clears throat> I'm not sure what all the others are. We did get some comments, uh, but I think that the main takeaways here are is that that threat hunting is something that helps organizations. And if the numbers for the first two here go for early detections before anything big happened, then it's totally worth the while, right? Because the damages there are super big. And when you can catch them before they do any harm, uh, you are really better off. Uh, and how do you do that? And, and that is something that we try to, to make clear on the next slide or to figure out on the next slide. And, and you gave us the information for that. How do you stay up to date? As Josh already pointed out, we are strongly dependent on, on threat intelligence because we need to figure out how to build our hunts, right? So what are, what is our risk profile? So what can our adversaries do? What are their options? What are their capabilities? What do they want from us? And for that, threat intel is very important and it needs to be up-to-date threat intel. As Josh said, the best breaches to learn from are your own. If you don't have your own, I think the next best thing is your peers in the industry because those breaches and, and the, the goals that the attackers have might be very similar to, to the ones um, that attackers that attack you might have. And only then you have all that outside intelligence, right? And uh, as we can see again, and Josh pointed it out, number one is clearly vendor blocks and papers. Uh, mainly that might be because they are very easy to access. They are very well promoted. So there's never a day where I don't get um, an email from a vendor where they have some new intel that they want to share. So it's it's way more than I can I, and that I can digest in any way. It's just too much, right? Independent blocks and papers. Well, the question is, how do you judge if it's in independent or not so independent? That's always tough to say. But at least uh, blocks and papers that seem to be independent um, 
that is also making up um, a huge portion there. The question is always what kind of insight does the author have into the particular threat profile and risk profile uh, that, that your company is concerned with. Then um, at 55%, we have the commercial intelligence providers, and that is a mix of more strategical intelligence versus real indicators that you ingest. Um, so it, it's a huge mix, and that might also make up the, the larger number. What surprised me this year and what surprised me very much is that we have 50% of our respondents doing their own research. Uh, that is way more than expected. So if you would have asked me beforehand, I would have said maybe 25%, and that's already on the high side. And then it came back with 50%, and that is very interesting, right? Because that means uh, when you look at the at the, uh, the demographics of our survey, that means that we also have mid-sized companies at least, and maybe even small-sized companies doing their own research. And that's cool because that will further the whole industry very quickly. Then we have OSINT providers. OSINT is great, but very often it's old, right? Once it makes it into the OSINT world, it, it might already be old, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable because very often attackers don't change, particularly ransomware actors don't change too much what they do and what they use. So we even had samples that were used in like three, four attacks or over a couple of months. Same samples, even same hash. Uh, it happens every now and then. Governmental organizations, that is something that is hard to judge because that might change across uh, uh, different countries. Some countries are better at that. They have better departments that notify their industries about uh, imminent breaches and stuff. Some countries are worse, right? So that is what probably many of you experience when you are working in, in multiple regions uh, that some regions or the government in some regions is more helpful uh, in, in, in them and less helpful in others. Um, and that um, allows me to hand over to Josh again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, also, just a reminder that uh, there is uh, a competition running inside of Slack. So do make sure you, you join the Slack channel. Um, I believe the information has been put back into the the webinar chat as well, just so you can see the link to get in there. Um, but I know that they're doing some competitions in there as well if you, if you want to join in with those. All right, so looking at threat hunting methodologies, I'll kind of speed along here so we don't run too slow on time. But one thing that we have started to do over the years that Matt and I have been authoring this paper is we've started to track better changes over years because we kind of find that, that trend change really interesting to find out what's happening inside of our industry. Uh, so a couple of kind of key things here, the, the graph on the left-hand side where we start to all ask organizations um, if they are using a clearly defined methodology to do threat hunting. Uh, so we've seen, again, a, a big increase uh, between last year to this year around people who are doing uh, formally defined threat hunting methodologies. And, and again, I think that also then comes out in some of the metrics we're going to look at in, in a moment as well. Um, we, we have seen a decrease in those that are doing that are defining their own methodology, but it's more ad hoc, which is wonderful, given that we are seeing an increase in the, the formal measuring as well. On the right hand side here, it, it's a, a look at how often people are reviewing their threat hunting methodologies. And this is important because technology changes, as Matt just mentioned there, even with sort of the, the increased use in the cloud, that is kind of one part of, of changing in technology, but also how we're using those parts of the technology with people going from virtual machines in the cloud to containers inside of the cloud. And how does that change your risk profile and, and sort of your, I guess, sort of the landscape of what you have to defend from an organization? Now, although the, the large portion is still whenever we need for this year being um, a little over 35%, it is decreasing year on year. And that's a good sign. We are seeing a move away from a more ad hoc change to methodologies to, to people kind of um, a big increase to looking at that from a monthly basis, which is really good. We probably think that's a little bit too fast and we give a little bit of commentary on that inside the paper as well. Uh, we're seeing people kind of increasing doing that quarterly, which is a pretty reasonable uh, move with with reviewing that methodology and then also people doing it annually as well, although that has shifted down a little bit. Doing it annually or quarterly is probably suitable for most organization when it comes to building a methodology, particularly if you've kind of thought out that methodology. I guess the only reason to kind of move that faster would be if tooling has changed or if you built that methodology with a lot of constraints wrapped around it, you could start to open it up as, I guess, sort of tooling or funding or resourcing kind of changes with inside of your team. 
Uh, after that, we start to look at what organizations have done outsourcing for threat hunting. Again, as I mentioned at the start with, um, this is interesting because when people outsource threat hunting, they're kind of putting it back in the hands of someone that might not know their IT environment as well as the organization itself does. And I guess from Matt and my perspective, that's kind of an interesting move because it often means that you spend a fair amount of time as the, the the outsource provider coming in to sort of understand that landscape as well. And the other challenge you could have, and it's something that we kind of thought about adding for future years, is do you use the same outsource provider year on year? So if you do, you kind of then have a bit of, I guess, sort of inherent knowledge with that outsource provider, or are people kind of shopping around and using different providers as well, which may make it hard for a brand new provider to kind of understand your threat landscape. Interestingly, we, we, we see, saw a big jump of that um, in the results for this year. We did see that kind of trend down, which we were kind of pretty excited about because people were bringing that in-house and bringing resources internally and training people up and, and allowing them to understand the environment. But there was a big shift to, to that moving to an outsource provider this year. Now, it could, we kind of speculated around this. I mean, from a cybersecurity perspective, there's not probably a, a huge um, reason for that. Maybe this is more of a an economic reason with economic changes in, inside of a lot of organizations and a lot of countries kind of shifting um, staff or, or, or kind of um, sort of altering their budgets internally as well. And that might explain why people are starting to outsource this. They may just not have the staff internally to look at it as much. But again, we, we talk about some of that inside of the paper as well. So, so go and download that and, and uh, take a bit of a look at it. Um, in terms of things like formally measuring threat hunting, again, we saw a, a huge increase this year to those who are formally measuring threat hunting. And this, this kind of does align a, a fair amount with those that are now doing things like have formal methodologies for threat hunting as well. Again, we saw a big increase of that. Um, to kind of remind you that the numbers were actually very, very similar in terms of last year to this year, in terms of those that had developed methodologies formally. And we're seeing the same in terms of those that are measuring success and effectiveness, because obviously that becomes a lot easier if you have a methodology to actually measure that against. So that might explain why we're seeing that big increase, but this is important because it shows organizations how important threat hunting can be. And we do also look at that in the paper. We, we've, we, we, won't get time to talk about that today, but we do look at that in the paper in terms of where organizations are seeing success when they are doing that measurement and how much success they are seeing in those different areas as well. And, and that's great. I mean, the, the short version of the story is those that measure it see a significant amount of success and, and some see some really big success in different areas because they are doing threat hunting and, and how that kind of improves overall security inside of their environment, not just improving catching threat actors, but improving other things like better detections or better configurations or stronger configurations inside their environment. So there's lots of these kind of really good beneficial fallouts from doing threat hunting and being able to measure that as well. And with that, I'll, I'll kind of hand over to Matt to do a quick talk of, of some of the takeaways we found in the paper this year. Yeah, let's do a, a very quick one. We don't have that much time left. So uh, first of all, what we saw is that um, a lot of organizations, uh, the small majority of organizations are working to, uh, on their contextual awareness. And that's super important that you get the full picture when you threat hunt. Otherwise, uh, you might draw the wrong conclusions and steer the ship into the wrong directions. What could help there and what also 47% plan to incorporate is machine learning and artificial intelligence into the tools that might also help addressing a few of those things. So that also involves a lot of investment. Obviously, when we're talking about new tools, uh, more sophisticated threat hunts, that costs money, that's for sure. And organizations today have found that threat hunting is worth uh, the efforts, so they're going to put the money into that. Um, so we don't probably going to lose a lot of resources uh, that we already have in threat hunting. So we don't have those limitations. 
the only limitation is staff. So everyone who tries to hire right now incident responders, threat hunters, it's really difficult to get them. Tools help us very much in, in many regards, but usually they first start helping us out on the lower tier levels of a SOC and not on the high tier levels with threat hunters um, and incident responders. And that's going to remain a big problem. I'm pretty sure about that for the next uh, few years because AI, machine learning, all of that usually starts at the bottom of the pyramid and not a, at the top where we need them. That's that's the problem. Josh, do you have anything to add that I forgot about? Um, no, I think that, I mean you kind of touched on that well in terms of that that's that kind of skill shortage as well. But also, um, one thing that's really important for people to understand is that even with with things like new AI and ML kind of getting pushed into tools, there is also this concept of having skilled people that know how to drive them and ask the right questions or to feed the right data into those tools. So. Um, so uh, I guess kind of the interesting takeaway that I kind of saw is that although people are kind of planning to incorporate kind of these new tools and technologies, as we've seen kind of throughout many, many years now, Matt, that, that those tools are only as good as the people that are actually at the other end driving those tools or feeding those tools. Yeah, I'm usually saying that differently, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you are, you are. You, you've usually got a lot more color in it. Uh, but given it's recorded today, I'm not going to yeah. repeat what you, know, what you normally say yeah. there. Um, it's or, in your survey, the, in the last yeah, year's that's, survey at least. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I think there was a nice call out of it in last year's survey, if, uh, if those of you who go back and have a bit of a read of it. All right, with that, uh, we have uh, John Gamble coming up. So uh, I'll hand over to John to do a little bit of introduction to himself uh, and we'll hand control over to you as well, John. So uh, you'll be able to take control and, and, and start to run through the slides. As always, feel free to kind of ask questions. Um, if there's anything that John kind of misses, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll try and roll those back into the um, panel session right at the end. Uh, I'll check with you, John, that we can hear you and, and see you. How, how can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes, I can see you and hear you. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Matt, and fans for having us back. We're, we're happy to be sponsoring the survey again. Uh, some great results this year. Really interesting to see some of the needle movement and some of the survey results. I'm John Gamble. Uh, I'm at Corelight. I've spent my whole career in cybersecurity across endpoint, network identity, a whole kind of range of disciplines. And uh, I love talking about threat hunting. I love meeting threat hunters and future threat hunters as well. And uh, if, if I'm gonna take the next 15 minutes and, and kind of leave you with, with something, it's an impression of the role that the network can play in your threat hunting operation and journey uh, and the importance of visibility, right? We, we saw some of this in the survey results, which I'm gonna talk about in a few slides, um, but you know, visibility is where threat hunting really starts. Uh, we like to say it's, it's the threat hunting ground uh, it is built on visibility. And the network has a really important role to play in that. And so that's kind of what I want to take you through in these next 15 minutes and look at some of the survey results and, and kind of discuss, uh, you know, how that relates to this topic. So first, kind of a, a quick uh, uh, you know, slide here. You may have seen something that looks like this before. Uh, some call it the SOC visibility triad. Um, I just like to call it, you know, a great essential set of tools for threat hunting. Um, you know, the network is a great source for visibility breadth, and the endpoint is a great source for depth. Uh, we love to say that internally, and many people say that outside of our company as well. You know, the network is really great at helping you see the forest for the trees, right? Zooming out, big picture, patterns, change over time. Uh, but if a particular tree in the forest is on fire or there's a problem with it, you're going to want to double click on it. And that's the end point. And it's those two really fundamental complementary sources of visibility that can give you a much more holistic uh, and contextual picture of what, what the heck is happening. And of course, Ideally, you're able to centralize that, right, in a, in, a, in a single kind of source of truth that's accessible to your team. Namely, a SIM is, is what we see in terms of design pattern, but it doesn't have to be. We, we see other we see other organizations that are using custom data data lake tools or using other tools and getting data into it. Um, you know, wherever you're able to consolidate uh, and, and kind of see both sides of this coin, you're going to have hunting ground, which is kind of the starting place if you're going to be able to affect the threat hunt. This is a, a diagram that kind of shows some of the, the five axes that we think about internally when we think about threat, threat hunting program maturity. Um, but for the purposes of the next couple of minutes um, and, and today's discussion, I really just want to focus on two, right? I want to focus on data and people and processes, right? And the reason is because as we saw in the survey result, right? These were number one and number two uh, biggest cited challenges, right? In unlocking threat hunting capabilities in organizations. Number one was of course staff, right? Um, 
while reduced, right? That's great. That's that's a positive, you know, change. I would say year over year survey result, right? Um, last year it was it was nearly three and four people, right? We're saying, gosh, I can't can't find anybody. Less this year, but still very high, right? Half of organizations are reporting this is their number one challenge, followed by data, right? Data quality, data data availability, data standardization, right? The the, the number two cited challenge uh, by organizations in the survey is around data quality. So I really want to kind of zero in on these two things. And, and kind of walk you through some of our thoughts about how the network uh, can help you uh, in these dimensions. So let's start with the second data maturity. Um, again, you know, I think we we saw you know a thirty percent year over year increase here in terms of reporting uh, of of data being a challenge, right? Um, that's not a good thing, in my opinion. Um, it, it signals to me that organizations are dealing with with technology as it is, which is ever expanding, ever changing, ever growing, right? Of course, uh, you know, it, and I don't like to see this result, but it's not surprising to me, right? Cloud footprints are growing uh, at astronomical rates. Um, you know, there's all sorts of new devices uh, and, and, and connectivity that's happening. Uh, network and, and organizational footprints tend to expand if you're in a growing business. So it's not surprising to me that this has increased year over year as a problem for organizations. Um, and you have, you know, Almost half of organizations now reporting that quality or quantity is, is kind of the primary problem here. And about a third uh, reporting that it's a lack of data standards, right? And this 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 axis that you see here on the bottom, right, is a is kind of a way to think about data maturity. It's it's how we talk about data maturity in terms of threat hunting. And it starts on the left side, right? Ad hoc visibility, right? Basically grab the visibility that you can, right? Wherever it's available, try to try to get it. It's better than nothing, but the the challenges are right, it tends to be unstructured and full of gaps and hard to get, you know, reliably into a central source of truth. And then you you switch all the way to the far end of the maturity spectrum on data and you're looking at an advanced data maturity model for threat hunting programs where visibility is actually architected. Now, that's a luxury that many security teams don't have, um, but it is a destination worth aiming for. And we do see organizations that have achieved it. And what, you know, architect visibility can look like is, you know, a, a, a design pattern for security visibility that is standardized uh, and agreed upon by an organization, which means every time a new data center spins up or office gets opened or you name it, um, this visibility and data design pattern that the security team needs to do their job is already deployed because that's a standard that's been architected. Um, and, you know, in that perfect world, and again, you know, I, I, I realize the challenges inside of security teams these days with budget, staff, pooling, et cetera, but that single data lake, right, that, that promise of that one source of truth where you can go and see all of your alerts, see all of your logs, all in one place. Um, I have seen some organizations achieve that. It's obviously very expensive in some cases, but um, certainly consolidation at the far end of the spectrum is, is, is a good signal of data maturity here. Now the network, right? One of the challenges with the network is that uh, a lot of the sources, standard sources of network visibility that security teams rely on today, especially for threat hunting, um, they weren't in most cases designed for security use cases, right? Um, I sometimes call them IT exhaust. Uh, the idea there being that a lot of the logs that you're getting off of network infrastructure were originally and, and fundamentally designed for IT and networking team use cases, right? The data in those in those sources of telemetry is for debugging, tuning, troubleshooting, right? Packet drop analysis, right? It's That was kind of the primary use case in, in many cases, not all, but most. Um, and security teams grab them because they're available which is great. Some visibility is certainly better than no visibility, um, but we're built for security use cases, which means they're often missing certain layers of data that you might want in a security context for a particular part of your organization. And these sources of data don't necessarily talk well together, right? Um, time stamping, right? Suddenly you're trying to correlate this log over here from this, from this server and this log over here and the, U the UTC time formats off and now you're out of luck, right? They weren't designed to interconnect and, and interrelate. Um, and look, you can definitely threat hunt on these sources of information. I'm not here to tell you you can't, and we see many organizations doing it. NetFlow, for example, can certainly be a useful piece of information in, in a threat hunt. But I am saying that it's challenging um, and that the organizations we see that have progressed along the data maturity journey of threat hunting um, typically uh, start here and evolve beyond it because there is a better alternative uh, than, than playing this kind of what I like to call a bad puzzle game where, where half the puzzle pieces are missing and the ones you have don't necessarily fit together well. Um, 
it's okay if you're starting there. And if that's what you've got today, there's certainly productive threat hunting capabilities you can build on top of this network visibility. But I would encourage you to think about your next step in your, in your journey of data maturity. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Well, you might be asking, what, what could be a solution here, right? What, what, what could we do to, to, to address that? Um, this is a quote I like, uh, it's from almost a decade ago, but it's still very relevant. Uh, Rob Joyce, who at the time was the head of the TAO group, which is the Tailored Access Operations Group, the offensive cyber branch of the US kind of military. Um, so these guys are basically red team, right? In this scenario, he was asked, Hey, what keeps you up at night in terms of your team's kind of, uh, objectives that would, would threaten your objectives? And he said, if the other side, the blue, the defenders in this case, were holistically monitoring my network, that would keep me up at night because you can't avoid the network. You have to traverse the network at some level in, in almost every single attack. And he knows that, which is why he said this quote. And I think it's just a powerful illustration of, of what I'm trying to communicate, which is that the network is a huge source of leverage uh, for teams if they can unlock better network visibility. So a quick kind of example, right, about, well, what's the difference here, right? Well, for example, DNS, right? DNS is prolific. It's, you know, beloved by adversaries because it's a really noisy place to hide and do really bad things like communicate to C2 servers or exfiltrate data. We were talking earlier. I think Josh was mentioning ransomware. Um, DNS is a place adversaries love to hide. And your typical DNS server log is pretty sparse. Um, again, not really designed for security use cases, but still useful in some cases. What you see on the top there is is a Zeek DNS log. And if you've never heard of Zeek, uh, just a quick quick 101, it's an open source network security monitoring tool. And it can do exactly the thing that you just saw on the previous slide that kept the red team up at night. It's capable of that, holistic network security monitoring across protocols, ports, et cetera. And that's an example of its DNS log you see there on the top. I'm not gonna go through it, we don't have time, but you can already see that it's richer, right? It has more data. It has data that might well be useful, right? In a security investigation, context, such as the actual content of what the DNS response got back, which is not always present in a DNS server log. That response can be very, very interesting in some cases during threat hunt investigations. So what can you do? You know, I would recommend deploying a NDR, network detection response, and or network visibility solution in your environment to help open that aperture. You know, start baselining, start understanding your, your network. If you've seen one network, You've seen one network. There's so much weirdness in everyone's network. It does take time to learn and understand what that looks like. Um, you know, of course, the the end targets here when we're threat hunting, they're typically endpoints, servers, right? Physical uh, assets. Um, recognize that, but also recognize that again, forest to the trees. The network is this great place to start. In fact, many of our organizations and, and our client base that are pretty advanced in terms of threat hunting to tell us that they typically start from a network perspective in, in terms of their threat hunts and then rotate and pivot into uh, endpoint level telemetry. So real quick here in our last five minutes, um, let's talk about people in process, right? The other big challenge that was cited in this survey. Um, about half of orgs are using, you know, internal staff. So almost, you know, almost, almost 50% of, of in, of threat hunting is occurring in house, which is great. Although we did see a decrease as, as Josh and Matt mentioned earlier, year over year, pretty considerable de decrease uh, between last year's survey results. Um, we could speculate on why that is, macroeconomic conditions, staffing, it's, it's, it's a challenging world out there, but I think it's still a positive that almost half of organizations are using internal staff, and we've got about a third that are outsourcing uh, to, to third parties. And you see the same kind of maturity uh, uh, x-axis here at the bottom that we saw on the data side. This is how we kind of think about people in process maturity um, at, at Corelight, and when we're talking to customers, you know, at the beginning stage, right? Hunting is something you get assigned on top of your normal day job, right? <laughs> it's one more thing to, to your already, bit, you know, full plate as a security analyst. And that's great. That's a great place to start. Um, as you move along the spectrum, right? You, you, you can get to the kind of the advanced stages, right? Where it's actually a team. Um, and that team might not just be hunting for techniques and tactics and procedures. They might actually at the very far end of the spectrum, literally be hunting for individuals and organizations that they know are attacking their organization. We have seen that sort of behavior at the, at the very, very high end of the spectrum. I, I'm certainly not here to say that's an accessible thing to all organizations. It's probably not given staffing and budget, but it is quite a, a destination to get to if you can ever reach it. Um, and measurement, right? Uh, I think we saw some good survey results this year that shows that, you know, program measurement is increasing year over year, which is great, right? Because you've got to ultimately justify threat hunting to your superiors, to your boss, to their bosses, right? Why are we doing this activity that's proactive? And we might not find anything, you know, 
Is that absence of value? Not necessarily. But knowing where to hunt, right, is kind of the hardest part. And, you know, I like to say any security analyst can start threat hunting, right? If, if they just have the right data and they have a little bit of guidance on where to start looking, especially on the network side. Um, Corelight, we've put out this free resource. Uh, it's a 45 page free uh, uh, white paper. It's got technical guidance. It, it's basically a guidebook about how to threat hunt on the network. Um, and I like to call it our quarter million dollar thing that we give away for free. I think it's probably more like a million dollar asset we give away for free because it's the distillation of a bunch of really talented and smart people at our company who used to threat hunt or work on the other side for all manner of very large organizations and government and defense and intelligence spaces. And we basically took their brain trust and distilled it into 45 pages of network guidance. Um, and we give it away for free. Um, and so it's a really great resource as you're starting to think about your threat hunting journey. Maybe it's day one. Maybe you're more in the in, in intermediate stage. Maybe you're advanced. I think there might be something in there for you. And I'd really encourage you to go download it and check it out. It's mapped to MITRE ATT&CK, by the way. So it's a really helpful way for a measurement perspective to help you understand what you're looking at on the network. And again, if you have visibility, some form of data visibility today, and you have guidance, i.e. something like our threat hunting guide, you can actually get started today. Um, this is just a quick screenshot of a sample threat hunt that theoretically you could you could go do with that guide and some data, right? It's a Splunk screenshot you're, you're looking at here. Uh, it's got Zeek logs inside of it from Corelight, uh, but you could get it from open source too. And it's basically looking for abnormally long DNS queries, right? DNS queries that are over 25 characters in length. You might be wondering, why would you do that? Well, a threat hunter might have a hypothesis that I think DNS traffic is being abused to possibly exfiltrate data. Back to the ransomware point that was made earlier, because backups are pretty common now, the ransomware actors are switching to data exfiltration and trying to hold data hostage and threatening to leak it. So data exfiltration over DNS is definitely something you want to be paying attention to and possibly hunting against. And this quick here, query here shows you how you would do that in your SIM. Here it would be Splunk uh, and against logs that you would you know, be generated in a network security monitoring kind of context from a tool like Z4 Corelight or others. So again, I think any analyst can get started today, you know, uh, as long as your boss is willing to give you a little bit of time dedicated a week, um, you can start small, you really can. Um, come up with a couple theses of things you wanna look for, set up those queries, set them to run, make it a scheduled thing, come back and look at it a week, two weeks later, maybe you didn't catch anything in your trap. That's okay. The absence of discovery is not lack of value in threat hunting. In fact, what you've done there is disproven uh, a potential for risk in the organization, right? You've established whatever that behavior or thing I was looking for is didn't exist inside of those time period that I looked at it. That's helpful from a risk reduction of knowledge perspective. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, oh, that's my time. I'll wrap up real quick. Um, you know, look for help too outside of the security team, I would say as well. You know, most security teams can't afford somebody with a data science background. That's a pretty sophisticated, highly budgeted thing. But you might be surprised that adjacent orgs in your company are willing to potentially lend you some of the time of their folk uh, with some really interesting challenges, right? Security challenges are fascinating. Um, and there's definitely data science talent in-house at many organizations beyond, you know, uh, uh, you know, a couple hundred employees. There's someone in your organization that might have a data science background that might be willing to, to, to add a little bit of responsibility to their job and help you guys out uh, on your hunting journey. Quickly, Corelight, and then I'll turn it back over to the next presenter. You know, we're an open network protection and response vendor, open because we're based on open source. So those deep capabilities you saw, we can certainly help you deliver. Um, and, uh, you know, I love talking open source, so feel free to ping me afterwards. If you have any questions, we can help you with visibility across your network, in the cloud, on-premise, hybrid. We can put it wherever you want. Our SaaS infrastructure, a stim like Splunk, it's up to you. And yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we really, really appreciated it. Great. Thank you, John. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Adam Lopez. Uh, I am the Director of Solutions Engineering with HIAS. Uh, I'm going to dive in here uh, and, and make sure I make the most use of my time. But I first wanted to thank Josh, Matt, and uh, Sands for the opportunity, as well as, uh, you know, this is HIAS's first time sponsoring the the webinar. And we're looking forward to, to many more to come. Uh, a little bit more about myself, and then we'll jump right in. 
Uh, so I've been in the security space for the better uh, part of a decade now, and mostly on the SOC uh, security operations side, both from an IR perspective, threat hunting perspective, but uh, most recently, uh, as you see there, as a solution en engineer and really focused on uh, those aspects of, of the business. Uh, so I'm going to dive in here. Today, we're going to talk about uh, some threat hunting techniques in terms of adversary infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, John John's talk just recently or previous to mine really dived into visibility into the network. So we're going to assume that you've already kind of have that that uh, that visibility, and and now you're looking at it from the other side, right? So from the adversary infrastructure of what might be out there on the internet from resources and aspects of what threat actors and adversaries are actually own or utilizing to conduct their attacks. So for, first, I'm going to mention or go over what uh, VRA uh, and what we uh, consider VRA here at Hyas, uh, leveraging infrastructure knowledge. So what does that mean? And there's some ties there to uh, some of the survey results when it comes to uh, data, right? Lack of, uh, of accurate data, uh, as, as well as um, some visibility aspects. And then I'm going to go over two case studies. One actually hits right on a business email compromise attack. And I chose that one specifically because of the survey results and thought it would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty relevant in terms of, uh, you know, what we look at when we're when we're looking at those types of threats. And then we'll go into another case study and then some some key takeaways. So, VRA. What is VRA? So, we consider VRA a framework for uh, utilizing uh, threat hunting techniques as well as methodologies and a way of looking at adversary infrastructure. So, verdicts in terms of what are the conclusions of IOCs, right? Are they malicious, benign? Uh, maybe it's based on behavior, uh, context, you know, metadata related to that IOC. Uh, R is related infrastructure. So what do we know about related infrastructure when it comes to domains, IP addresses, hashes, hashes that are used to launch attacks or, um, you know, to, to run C2 servers or to generate, you know, different types of malware. Um, and then actors, right? A lot of times, Organizations think of actors as your, your cozy bears or APT thirty three or what have you. But when we talk about talk about actors, it's really at the org level, right? So, what are some attributes that you know characterize behaviors or capabilities into a group that might be targeting your organization? Um, those could be things like, okay, we have we just did a threat hunt that has these four IOCs or these characteristics of a specific actor. Maybe it's a low level actor. Right? It doesn't have to be a nation state. It doesn't have to be an APT group, uh, but it's something specific to our organization. And as you as you probably you know see on the screen, verdicts related infrastructure and actors, they're not new, right? But oftentimes they're siloed. And so what we've done is developed a framework to kind of use these as a way to uh, to interact with each other and piggyback off of the different elements of infrastructure that we have knowledge of or that we can gain knowledge of. Um, and you know, one of the survey findings that that I thought was interesting was around structured tracking of a threat. Um, and this is is just that, right? Using a VRA framework is a, a way to kind of track a threat, um, whether it's the verdicts of an IOC, whether it's related infrastructure in terms of, okay, these IP addresses all resolve to uh, or these domains resolve to this specific IP address, which also is hosting C2 infrastructure as an example, and just being able to have uh, that visibility into the other side of the the, uh, the attack, uh, you know, in terms of infrastructure. So leveraging infrastructure knowledge, um, you know, what does that even mean? Or wh what are some things you can do uh, from a threat hunting perspective, whether it's as an individual threat hunter, or as you start to build out more of a mature uh, process or methodology? Um, one thing that that I, I believe you need to have, and I think this was uh, touched on a little bit within the survey is unique data that derives from different types of sources. So when we say authoritative, we think we mean coming from the source itself. So think of it as a primary source of data versus a secondary source or an aggregated source of data, uh, but then also commercially available and then open source. So authoritative could come from, for example, a uh, registrar themselves, right? So being able to actually gather telemetry and data from a domain registration or registrar themselves would be considered authoritative data. A commercial set of data, of course, right? Passive DNS, something that that uh, vendors are, are really, really keen on on aggregating and providing in terms of different feeds or, or, or intelligence offerings, and then open source. But having a good mix of those is, is key in, uh, you know, leveraging infrastructure knowledge. 
And then not just the sources of data, but what types of data are you actually, do you have access to? Um, so when you are, you know, and, and John mentioned DNS, right? We love DNS at Hyas. Um, it's a great place to threat hunt. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of, of, of security professionals just don't realize that you can find in DNS. Um, and as you can see here, uh, complementary data sets like DNS data, host posture data, malware, geolocation data, uh, C2, JARM, right? All of these individually obviously have their own unique advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but when you start to pair those together and start to leverage those to pivot off of one another and the different relationships and, and um, patterns that are visible in those types of data sets, it becomes a really great way to uh, leverage that infrastructure knowledge. Um, another thing around or another aspect is context and pivotability. pivotability. So coming from my SOC back background, and I'm sure many of you on the webinar agree, right? Context is king. Uh, you know, a DNS log may, might mean something different based on the context, right? The type of environment, where it's coming from, the endpoint, um, the network it's on, right? So all of these different aspects in terms of being able to add context to what you're looking at is, is really key in terms of understanding the infrastructure side of the house. And then being able to pivot, um, whether this is through tools, whether this is through homegrown processes or internal methodologies and processes around the the kind of the workflow and the logic that you should take as a threat hunter, um, that's really key. One, because if we have, you know, a, a less mature staff or knowledgeable security team, which many of us do, um, having those having those methodologies kind of built out to, to provide playbooks, runbooks for threat hunters to pivot off of data sets is really key in terms of, uh, you know, speed, accuracy, and, and, and outcomes. Um, and, you know, one of the things we that we saw in the survey about adapting techniques by hunters, right, really resonated with me uh, because a lot of times in the organizations I've been a part of, uh, that threat, the threat hunting has been more ad hoc. But as we start to uh, generate tons of more data, both internally on the network, as well as externally from the infrastructure side of, of threat actors. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we need to make sure that we have those, those elements uh, taken care of. So we're going to jump into a couple of use cases here. Uh, one is a, what, what, what I call, this is something that I uh, investigated myself and was doing some threat hunting on uh, internal to highest, uh, what we call QWERTY Zang. So this is a cybercrime gang operating out of various countries in Africa, conducting business email compromise attacks, targeting real estate industry, among others. Um, some of the TTPs, uh, they were using weaponized Office 365 Excel spreadsheets and then utilizing typo squatting and domain lookalikes to essentially fish would-be victims. Um, so one of the, the interesting aspects or pieces of telemetry that we were able to uncover was uh, hosted domains on malicious infrastructure. So they were looking to hide in the noise uh, in terms of the IOCs or the IP addresses that all of these domains were registered to. These IPs were also associated with other types of, of malicious activity. As you can see up there, that, that .207 uh, IP address hosted out of the United Kingdom. Uh, in a lot of the telemetry and data that we were utilizing to actually threat hunt, as you can see, who is passive DNS, C attribution data, malware detonations, those all had association to this IP address. Uh, now, what I was able to do is uncover through some who is data and what I talked about around authoritative data from a registrar, being able to uncover the email address that was used to register 823 domains. What this allowed me to do is then be proactive in understanding where these threat actors were targeting next. Um, and I actually started seeing patterns in terms of not only targeting the real estate industry, but based on new domain registrations that we know are tied to those same registration-based details, targeting now, um, you know, uh, uh, heavy equipment and uh, operational technology type of companies, right? OT environments. So you can start to see a shift in where these threat actors were were targeting uh, based on the the uh, the IOCs that we were then monitoring from the the infrastructure side. So Cordy Zhang in terms of mapping to the VRA, right? So Vertex, we we uncovered malicious IPs and domains, malware families uh, within that, that infrastructure associated with Agent Tesla and InfoStealer, and of course, business email compromise attacks um, used to gain entry into those specific environments. Uh, 
Um, related infrastructure, right? 825 domain registered using the same registration details. Now, of course, that could have been multiple threat actors or a group of threat actors, uh, but having those similarities and those patterns allow allows you to uh, then make predictions or uh, threat hunt additional or create additional hypotheses off of the, the IOCs that you have. And then actors, right? In terms of uh, profiling those specific actors located in Africa based on device geolocation data that we were able to pivot off of um, using UK infrastructure and then using unique domains, right, to closely related to targeted victims. Um, Prospero, this is a, uh, a use case that is actually, uh, as of recent, um, an ASN block or an ASN identified as Russian-based bulletproof hosting tied to malicious activity targeting global global organizations, uh, again, in the financial industry. Um, now, interestingly enough, the financial industry that, or the FI that we were working with in terms of threat hunting for this specific use case was a pretty large global um, entity. However, their ability to stop this threat actor then falls downstream to a lot of the things we talk about around not having enough resources to go after certain threat actors. But based on what we saw in, in, the, in the telemetry and in the, in the data, they were also targeting other FIs downstream or maybe in the, the small to mid-sized market. Um, some of the TTPs targeting business clients of financial institutions, they were actually using uh, livechat.exe. What this threat actor failed to realize is that livechat.exe actually uh, logs the IP addresses that are being or that are communicating with that specific application. So capturing and grabbing those uh, IP addresses, as you can see in the IOC uh, list there off of the uh, machines and then using geolocation data to actually understand where those are located. These threat actors were actually operating out of the UK um, and uh, you know targeting a lot of uh, different uh, organizations in the UK, but also using various net blocks within this ASN to target other geographic uh, entities. So for example, a um, for example, a uh, a couple of IP addresses in that slash 24 were actually being used uh, to target Italian companies. Um, so it's interesting when you start looking at threat actor infrastructure and uh, being able to uh, really identify where threat actors might be operating from, whether they're targeting you as your organization or your industry and vertical and where they might be moving next. Again, Prospero, the, the, the VRA here, uh, Vertex, Domain Config History, uh, we saw risky third-party infrastructure and name server reputation. Uh, that actually all came from DNS. So kind of going back to John's example of how DNS can be very useful. Uh, related infrastructure, right? We saw net blocks associated with geographic targets. Uh, and then again, the actors here, it doesn't have to be Cozy Bear or some some known, you know, some well-known threat actor group uh, located in the UK. And, and in this case, uh, there's some of the TTPs were related to um, possibly tied to Scattered Spider, if you guys are all familiar with, with that threat actor group. Um, but what I wanted to leave you with here in terms of kind of some key takeaways is, again, that framework of VRA, uh, because when you start to look at verdicts related infrastructure and actors as a whole, it really can lead you into predictive threat hunting. Uh, so where you can take some proactive threat intelligence, kind of start driving your operational resiliency and using VRNA uh, you know, when you start to mature your program into a more of an automated approach and feed, you know, your incident response teams, new data as they feed you uh, IOCs. Um, so I'm going to, I'll pause there. I'll, I'll stop here. And, and again, thank you guys for the time and, and uh, I'll hand it back over to Josh or Matt or our next presenter. Yeah. So <laughs> this time we agreed on who's going to introduce um, our next speaker which would be Dave Bianco. So Dave Bianco has been around for a while in the in the threat hunting business. Uh, he's the inventor of the Pyramid of Pain that probably many of you know already. So he's basically um, a cowboy exploring unknown land in the threat hunting. And he now tells us how frameworks matter to do threat hunting in a structured way. Hey, Dave, nice to have you on. Hey, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And thanks to Matt for that, that great Western-themed uh, <laughs> introduction. Uh, thanks also, uh, Josh and Matt for putting the survey together and, and basically to everyone at SANS for having me on the webinar today. I appreciate it. So first of all, though, maybe I should say a little bit about myself. My name's David Bianco. Uh, as the slide says, I've been in cybersecurity 
for over 20 years. So mostly concentrating on blue team topics like incident detection, incident response, things that are closely aligned to those things like threat hunting. In fact, way back in 2015, 2016, I was the chief architect of what I think was the first published threat hunting methodology, the squirrel threat hunting model. These days, though, I work for Splunk's Surge cybersecurity research team, where I was fortunate enough to be able to update and expand on that work as the lead author of the peak threat hunting framework. And all that is just to say that I have a pretty good amount of experience with threat hunting, which is why I found one aspect of the survey's results particularly surprising. Just to back up a little bit and set the stage, the survey data this year shows that everyone is hunting. I think like one important thing to keep in mind though is that almost exactly half of the respondents rated their hunting program's maturity as either mature or very mature. That's pretty good uh, actually, but if you look at it another way, it also means that half of the respondents didn't think that they were doing very well at hunting, rating themselves either maturing or immature. So while we've definitely made some progress, we still have some more work to do here. I also found it interesting that so many respondents lacked a defined methodology for threat hunting. Like as a serial framework author, that hit me right in the feels. Um, again, nearly half said that they either don't follow any particular methodology and they have no plans to do so, or they do have plans maybe, but haven't defined the methodology yet. So I, I kind of have a suspicion. Like I have a strong suspicion that maybe these two groups of people like those who are not yet mature in their hunting and those who don't follow a formalized methodology, I suspect they have a high overlap. That is like, maybe they're not as mature as they could be because they're mired in ad hoc hunting processes and they constantly have to reinvent things as they go, maybe. Um, that though wasn't the most surprising thing I was, I have to say, I was a little shocked to read that hunting seemed to have actually hurt some organizations' security postures. Like, fully 22.8% of the respondents reported a, re a perceived decrease in their security readiness due to hunting. And that number jumps to 37.1% if you also include those who found no net change, which is still a decrease in my book, because if they weren't getting anything out of hunting, they could have used those resources on something else that would have given them a better return. Um, that That is just astounding to me. Like, especially considering that I personally, I see threat hunting as one of the key drivers of continuous improvement across your entire security program, which that is probably, by the way, the, the single biggest design principle that we baked into the peak framework. Uh, I can understand that organizations who are reporting maybe only modest increases from hunting, but to see like over a third of the respondents reporting that hunting actually made things worse or had or made no difference at all. I couldn't really figure that out at first. But then when I started, uh, when I noticed the, the possible correlation between hunting maturity and the lack of hunting methodology, methodology, then I started to wonder, like maybe all three of these results are correlated. Like, is it possible that hunting without a defined framework could actually be worse than no hunting at all, at least in some cases? I don't know if I quite believe that, but I'll say it's certainly plausible. Like a methodology or a framework like PEAK 
uh, is designed to help you establish reliable, efficient, repeatable processes. And all of these things are things that help promote positive outcomes. Like a good framework does a lot for you. It'll show you things like what type of hunts exists, how to perform each type in detail, and, and how to choose which type or maybe types best fit your specific uh, hunting use cases. So it's easy to see really why adopting a framework could help you get more success uh, out of your threat hunting. Another thing I, I wondered about that result though, was whether the responses were even true. Like the survey simply just, just asked respondents to estimate the improvement to security in percentage points. But I know from experience that a lot of organizations don't actually track security improvement from hunting, which I realize is a, a little bit at odds with, with one of the other results uh, reported this year. Uh, but even those who do, don't usually report it as percentages. So I wasn't quite sure how much credibility I should give that result um, in the first place. So remember when I said that one of the biggest design principles for PEAK was that hunting should drive security improvement across your entire program? The question of how to measure hunting success has always been a big one. It was probably like the number one or maybe number two question that I've got about hunting over the years. Like just because you hunted for something and didn't find it, that doesn't mean you failed. Uh, in fact, it's probably a good thing when you have evidence that threat actors are not doing something on your network. I never really felt like I had a good answer for for hunting metrics, though, until peak. Uh, that's because peak actually defines success as your hunting having a positive impact on security. And once we realized that, then we were able to design a set of basic metrics that would help you dis demonstrate how your hunting program is making things better, like across the board we provide in peak a starting set of metrics for things like improvements to automated detection, um, visibility gaps or vulnerabilities that you found and other things that, that kind of help you tell the story of not just how hard you're working, but what effect you're poking around in things while you're threat hunting is having on security, like again, across, across the board. Uh, so, Back to the topic of methodology, though, one of Peak's key features is that not only does it define three types of hunts that you can do, uh, we call them hypothesis-driven, baseline, and then the, the AI or ML-driven uh, model-assisted threat hunting or math approach. Uh, but Peak also lays out detailed step-by-step processes for each one of those hunt types. And the, like the one here on the screen is the hypothesis driven type, which I think most people on, especially on this call right now are probably pretty familiar with. So I won't go through each step box by box that we do have those details in the framework document. Like really what I just wanted to point out is what I think of as one of the most overlooked parts of threat hunting. And that is hunting is not just the data analysis piece. There is a substantial amount of preparation and planning that goes into making a successful hunt, as well as a certain amount of like documentation and other follow-up tasks involved in integrating what you learned into the rest of the security program, uh, turning your new hunting insights into actual tangible improvements in security. Each type of hunt in peak has this same consistent three phase structure with separate prepare, execute and act stages that uh, encourages hunters to allocate time, not just for the fun analysis piece, but also the the planning and the follow-up actions that they need to ensure success. Also, uh, each phase in, involves some measure of knowledge, 
which could be like threat intelligence and technique research in the prepare phase, uh, asset information or local business process context, uh, even security incidents uh, in the execute phase and, and things like hunt process documentation and stakeholder reports and stuff like that in the act phase follow-ups. That three-phase structure turned out to be so important that we actually ended up naming the whole framework after it. PEAK stands for Prepare, Execute, and Act with Knowledge. Now, I know I've been talking a lot about PEAK, so let me bring it back to the survey. There were some surprises in there for me, mostly about hunting maturity, methodologies, especially perceived decreases uh, in security readiness due to hunting. I don't know for sure, but I, I think that these all may be correlated. By adopting a framework that gives you a repeatable set uh, and efficient set of processes and provides more concrete measures of success, you can both improve your maturity level and ensure that you're actually getting substantial security improvements in return for all your hard work. Peak has proven to be very popular since we introduced it last year. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this, it's a, it's a free platform product agnostic threat hunting framework. You can use it whether you're a Splunk customer or not. Uh, check out the QR code on the screen, and I will also drop some links into the discussion um, just shortly. Peak was still pretty new when, when Matt and Josh started this year's survey, but uh, we managed to get a few shout outs in the not only the survey it's results itself, the, the report, but also a bunch of the um, a bunch of you respondents actually mentioned Peak, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I hope that next year, when the SANS threat hunting survey for 2025 comes out, we'll we'll actually see a lot more organizations adopting it, or at least something like it, uh, some framework, and and thus more programs rating themselves as mature, and of course a lot. Fewer, I hope, organizations with perceived security decreases. Okay, thank you very much for that, David. Um, and, and you're right; I can I can kind of give a a small insight into some of the data when we start to slice it up. That uh, those who who don't have a formal or or do have an ad hoc type methodology are, are usually the ones that uh, struggle to either determine what their what their metrics rating is or, or provide a metrics rating or, or see backwards drop in um, in sort of their their overall I guess sort of security increase in the organization we, we do uh, we have kind of looked at some of that data and we do run into some challenges with being able to represent some of it because there are some questions that don't let you progress past a certain point if you right. say no to some questions but but you are you are like you are definitely down the right path. Those those who don't have a a methodology to kind of stick to really kind of struggle with this challenge. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we did do a bit of a call out to Peak this year in the in the survey, which was nice. We got that in there, but it's it's nice to to see sort of these methodologies come about for threat hunting. I mean, it is in, in fairness things like cybersecurity and, and incident response and threat hunting are all relatively new industries that have have not existed for as long as something like medicine so having these new methodologies and frameworks come out is is just one way of trying to increase people's capabilities and, and also give them something to measure as well so that's um so so definitely have a look at peak for those of you who haven't heard about it before um it is definitely something to to sort of watch and and, and take a look at it and see if that's that will work for your organization and, and your team as well or even if that's something that you can start to push your outsourcing provider potentially to to potentially utilize <laughs> for for you as a customer okay with that uh we kind of move on to our panel session uh so it's a bit of an open question um i might kind of rotate the responses around a little bit so um, we might go the same order that we went with presenters. So uh, we might go John, Adam, and, and then David, and then we'll kind of rotate around um, for the next question. So our, our first question uh, is, 
Uh, what are the big cybersecurity concerns pertaining to threat hunting and global vulnerabilities that you're hearing from CEOs or CISOs or the C-suite essentially and IT professionals as we start to go into 2024? So I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to you first, John, if you want to um, let us know kind of what you're hearing from, from that sort of group. Sure. Uh, I'll give you a single and specific answer. Uh, ransomware, which we've talked about a little bit in this in this uh, presentation and, and session today. Um, you mentioned, I think it was you, Josh, you or Matt mentioned about how the adversaries are starting to switch up their tactics, right? Uh, because backups uh, are now more common, which is great. Uh, the effectiveness of basically locking uh, your, your, your disks and demanding, uh, you know, Bitcoin to get the uh, decryption key less effective these days. And so what we're seeing increasingly and what we're hearing from customers, CISOs alike, um, is, is the game is shifting on ransomware and they're, and they're more focused now on data exfiltration and then holding that data hostage outside the organization and threatening to leak it, whether that's sensitive you know, personal information or protected IP, right, in, in, in all sorts of industries, pharmaceutical, software, et cetera, um, which is good and bad, right, uh, uh, for, for the defenders. Um, Good that we've shifted them off of off of their classic uh, disrupt organizations, take everybody offline for five days, you can't open your laptop, that's good. Bad uh, because they're still at it and uh, this data exfiltration piece is, is, has, can have similar impact. The good news I think for threat hunting here is that that type of ransomware attack, in my opinion, it, it increases surface area potential to discover what's going on because they have to take a couple more steps um, to get the data out of your organization, right? Under your nose, which if it's a large amount of data, can be done, but 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 increases their exposure risk to discovery. Um, and there's a whole series of things that happen before that event as well that gives you as a threat hunter like potential to to, to catch them in the app. Um, difficult, but it's a little different than everything's encrypted. They turn you know they encrypted your disks and now you're screwed. Um, they have to do a little more work now, and it increases the the time that they have to be in your environment. I believe, um, and we've seen some evidence of that from some of our customers, which is cool. Yeah, that's right. And and also, I guess, the the challenge of being able to do things like track that when it's inside of like M365 sitting in the cloud, and then they just exfil it all out and and are happy with the the speed that they'll get straight from Microsoft's cloud to be able to pull that out and then, and then being able to actually monitor that type of activity as it occurs too. Uh, nice, nice. I like that one. Uh, what about over to you, Adam? What are you kind of hearing from from those groups around sort of what what are kind of the interesting things to go threat hunting for or all these kind of like new vulnerabilities that there might be challenges yep. going into this year? Yeah, and it's it's funny because I, I wish I could say it's something different than what I've said in the last three or four or five years, but it's 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 the same thing, honestly. And it's ransomware, phishing, business email compromise attacks, um, lack of network visibility for remote workers, right? When they have EDR on the endpoints at home, but they don't have network telemetry because they're not always on the network. Um, and so, you know, it, what I found interesting, though, is based upon who I'm talking to, the contacts and level of priority or severity changes when you talk about those threats, but they're always the same threats, right? So I was talking to a, a CISO uh, just the other week at a conference around um, attribution, threat attribution, threat actor attribution. And they're like, you know, we're not really interested in that because we're not really a target of nation states, but we're still concerned about ransomware from ransomware as a service from these low level, you know, threat actors that are going to come after us. So I just, you know, it's funny, it's, it's the same threats that we're seeing and, and which is why we're trying to look at different ways of doing things. Cause obviously there's, you know, there's, there's a, a change that needs to be, to be had. Um, and then of course that human element will, in my opinion, that hum, human element will always uh, leave, um, leave vulnerability uh, for those types of threats. And no matter how good your security is, there's always going to be that human error or human element that, um, is going to leave that vulnerable space, which is really what, you know, how can we change that? How can we uh, adapt moving forward? But um, but yeah, those are the things that I've been hearing as of late. Yeah, and that, that that concept of of an individual inside the organization just making a config mistake and and mistakenly like exposing something that they shouldn't um, is so simple to do as well. So someone being able to make that mistake and, and not realize it and then a, a threat actor kind of scan the edge of the network and be like all right we've like got this kind of unprotected rdp all of a sudden straight into the environment this this could be <laughs> bad bad news but you're, you're right like even like that's kind of a, a an old issue that has existed for a long period of time that, that is still still current today nice uh and what about uh, on your side david what are you kind of hearing from from these different groups as well on on what what things are kind of a concern for this year 
Yeah, I, mean, I think usually when I'm out talking to our customers about threat hunting, the biggest things are not specific threats, but they want to know, like they're not coming to me and say, yeah, we are really concerned about hunting for this or whatever. They, they actually come to me and they say, how should I know what should I be hunting for? And because because I I, mean, I'm, I realized in the survey, we said like uh, BEC and ransomware are the two the two big ones. To me, like if you're hunting for ransomware, you have gone seriously wrong because research, including research from my own team, shows that once the ransomware actors are in your uh, in your environment, your window for actually doing anything before they start to affect you is very small, like minutes, right? So you need automated detection for that. Similar, maybe not the same uh, degree, but same for business email compromise. Usually what I tell them though, is what you what you need to be hunting for varies by organization, but you you what you should do is have a, a hunting strategy of how you enumerate what you could be hunting for and prioritize it. Even something simple like, oh, I'm going to hunt for things that 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 affect my technology stack and uh, are you know start at the right end of the cyber kill chain, like the the things farther into the the life cycle, and then work your way to the the earlier parts of the life cycle. Okay. As yeah, yeah, that, that's that's exactly right, and and that's kind of a um, I, I mean it's something that we hear all the time around. Like you're exactly right. Like where do we go threat hunting? Like start at the the right hand side where things have gone really really wrong, and then move back the other way is, is kind of a, a good place to go looking for that. Um, you, you are very right. It's interesting that that people kind of say that they went uh, hunting for for ransomware. Um, I guess, and also to a degree, interesting that people. Well, I guess we asked them what they found more than anything else, um, which was was kind of interesting to see where that went. Um, there were also, uh, fortunately, like a, a lot of other kind of responses, but there were all kinds of like small individual responses, which kind of fall into that other category that we give a little bit more detail on, as well. Um, but it also interesting, interesting section to kind of see this year, which we hadn't kind of published in, in previous years either. So it might be interesting to kind of expand that out a little bit further and, and see where we go with that one. Uh, my hand over to you, Matt, if you want to run the next question. Yeah, if my connection keeps stable, uh, I'm going to give it a shot. So the next question uh, that uh, is a very interesting one, at least uh, for me as, uh, as someone working for an outsourcing provider as well. Have you seen any specific drawbacks of outsourcing your threat hunting to a third party? And also what kind of, of outsourcing arrangement is something that you consider working well and, and not working so well uh, regarding like full outsourcing or your work together with the people there? Um, I think Adam, you are the next in, in line, right? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll say for for the clients that we work with, um, we don't typically see a lot of full outsourcing of threat hunting. And mainly it's due to the reasons that you guys mentioned earlier, um, right? And and what some of the results in the survey discussed. What I will say is we, we do see a lot of kind of collaboration efforts when it comes to um, more of like threat hunting services. So working alongside an internal threat hunting team but bringing in expertise in certain domains or specific areas where maybe they might be lacking. Uh, so we, we work with like a large uh, credit card for provider that does just that, where they have an internal team that's really, really, really versed on like the, um, you know, credit card enumeration and fraud aspect of cyber. But then when they have some more kind of very specific cyber type of threat hunts, uh, they, they definitely bring in our team, um, and I see I've seen that across uh, you know multiple organizations. Typically, though, it's when you, you know, when you're a little bit larger and mature, and you have those resources and budget to actually have an internal threat hunting team. Um, but I would say even down you know mid market and those that maybe don't have specific threat hunting teams, I personally wouldn't recommend you know even as a vendor, right? I wouldn't recommend outsourcing your threat hunting 100 percent um, because I've been on the other side of it. I've I've been in SOC operations where. You're relying on those those uh, those you know those vendors or those solutions and and those threat intelligence feeds or whatever it might be, uh, but no one knows your network like you do, um, and so I think, in in my opinion, it would be some type of hybrid approach, 
where you're using a set of services from a vendor and maybe their solution as well. Um, but, but kind of blending that into your own methodologies and kind of, you know, hunting program. Yeah, I would totally agree to that because then you have the people knowing the network, but not the hunting, not so well. And you have the people who know how to hunt, right? Would right. be the best combination, at least theoretically. Uh, Dave, you're next. Um, so what's your experience? Actually, it's just very similar to what, what Adam said. Um, you know, I think you're right. I usually tell people that threat hunting itself is a skill that you need to develop. And you need to bring people into your threat hunting, like maybe not your threat hunting team, like your the full-time threat hunters, if you have them or the threat hunting function, but the, the party of people that are actually doing threat hunting for a specific hunt, you should have people who know threat hunting as a skill, but also people who have all that, that localized business and IT knowledge from your organization. That that is true, by the way, even if you're doing hunting in totally in-house, right? People from your SOC or your IT management or even uh, you know, other parts of your IT organization that have specialized skills, put them in with some people that have practiced the art of hunting uh and and set them set them to a, a hunting task for a couple of weeks. If you're thinking about a vendor, like I can't really tell you, uh, you should or should not think about outsource outsourcing threat hunting. I think it makes sense for some organizations and maybe it makes less sense for others. But if you are going to uh, do that um, kind of outsourcing, I think you you really should try to find a vendor who's willing to work with you because you can't effectively hunt in an environment that you are not really familiar with. So being able to partner with their clients is a key function for a successful like MSSP or threat hunting outsource provider. Yeah, otherwise you end up like an incident response where you constantly need to ask the client how their yep. network looks like, what a certain machine does and so on. Is this Thank normal you. for your environment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, often when it's not normal for you, it's normal for them, right? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I every you, if you look hard enough, there's abnormal things everywhere, and you have to. I, I I realize I'm about to sound like Donald Rumsfeld. You need to find the the abnormal abnormal things, and not the normal <laughs> abnormal things. <laughs> That's a good quote there, uh, John. What's your take on that? <laughs> Plus one to what both of the previous speakers said, and I'll add something too about like we've we've seen some great uh, third party threat hunters. We've had the privilege of working with some of them. And there's some incredible talent out there, and if you've got the budget to do some outsourcing and it's not going to happen in house otherwise, uh, go for it. And and hybrid too is great, especially because you can marry context with outside skill. One thing I'll just add is I think this is something you were talking about, David. Um, one of the benefits of keeping threat hunting in-house wherever you can is there are so many downstream second order benefits that you can derive from it that are maybe not self-evident, right? Like if you are threat hunting um, and you're also an incident responder, right? During your day job, you will be a better incident responder because you will through threat hunting, learn your environment better and be able to triage faster, make sense of things, connect dots that, right? If you're just staring at an alert queue all day, might not be evident because you're given the freedom to go out and sign up poke and prod and understand detection engineering, right? If you're if you're looking at that as a capability, like there's this threat hunting isn't this like activity that should live off in the ether and is its own thing. It should it's a it's a beautiful cycle that feeds on itself and improves itself if you work it into your stock because it makes everything else better in the process. You can start tuning alert technology better once you're like, hey, we discovered something really weird over here, which would explain why this particular tool keeps firing in this way. Hey guys, can we tune it down, right? We've literally seen conversations like that happen. So that's just kind of, there are there are ancillary benefits to threat hunting that improve your entire organization that if you can bring it in-house wherever possible, you can you can gain those benefits. Yeah, so absolutely. Gonna... It's, it's a really great uh, way to do skills and knowledge transfer within your security team too, when they're working together on the same hunt. Yeah, one thing I was just going to add, um, if I could, based off what John just mentioned, is when I, when I was in a SOC, as an analyst, it was very rigid, right? So it was, oh, I think there's something I should threat hunt. Give it to the threat hunting team. But to your point, John, I think I think nowadays there, there's an element of threat hunting in every security professional 
every security, you know, position that exists. And there probably should be for those reasons that you just mentioned. So, and I think there was touched in the survey a little bit about IR becoming more of a, more of a, a feedback loop for threat hunting. Uh, now, when I talk to SOCs, a lot of the analysts are doing threat hunting themselves. It might not be, it might be ad hoc. It might not be so much of a, you know, uh, you know, uh, programmatically. Right. But yeah, to your point, it, there should be an element of that in, in probably everything we do as security professionals, because it's so valuable and, and it's not seen as so much of a, it's over here on the side or, anymore. It's it really should be a, a kind of a, you know, a benchmark of your entire program. And, and I guess uh, to, to kind of add on to to that question and, and those answers that, we, that you've all kind of given there, like you've all talked about the the huge benefits that there are with with kind of doing that threat hunting internally. I guess given that we have seen such a big shift this year in the results of people actually outsourcing it, and and it's not, um, I guess, to add a little bit of context to this question as well. It's not just around um, a shared outsource. We we did see a drop in those that were doing sort of the hybrid model that were basically doing some um, some external consultants and some internal that had also dropped this year. But those which now are fully outsourced, which is a little over a third of, of respondents, what do you think has caused such a big shift all of a sudden, given that we were seeing that trend downwards over the last couple of years and all of a sudden to see that spike this year? Is is there anything that um, that I guess the three of you kind of think may have caused this kind of shift in in, in change of, of outsourcing threat hunting, given the the, the significant benefits that, that you're all kind of talking about there. Uh, we might start with uh, with you this time, David. Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. Um, partly, it could just be that uh, people are more, like organizations are more acknowledging that they need some sort of threat hunting going on and they're, a lot of times when I talk to an organization, even ones have been doing threat hunting for a long time, but especially when they're starting out, they want to know, like, are they doing it the right way? Or is there a better way? Or how do they get started? Like, even organizations who know they should be doing it, they're, they seem a little bit tentative at first to to get started. So I don't know, maybe... Maybe the outsourcing piece could be explained a little bit by like organizations knowing that they need to do it, but are not entirely sure how to get started, or maybe they're unsure if they have the resources to do it themselves. And so it's kind of like maybe they're thinking that it's an easy button. Like I yeah. can I can write a check and yeah. bang, we have threat hunting next week. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's <laughs> true, true. Poss possible. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. I, I, I like that theory. Uh, what about on your side, John? What, what do you think or have you heard anything that might be kind of influencing this kind of large shift to, to using an outsource provider for it? Yeah, I think as with all things in the world, there are probably multiple variables at play. I think David's case is pretty, pretty convincing. Um, I also think a factor could probably just be the macroeconomics that are happening right now. Um, you know, companies at all industries have been going through layoffs, rolling layoffs now for many quarters in a row. And I, I've seen some very talented security folk that I know, you know, like impacted by some of these layoffs at organizations. And I think we might be seeing some evidence of just classic corporate behavior in tighter economic conditions, which is outsourcing becomes a lot more <laughs> interesting to the management layer in the business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it was de definitely something that that um, that Matt and I were kind of hypothesizing on. It's although it, it is a little hard to kind of um, add much of a response into the the report when we don't have sort of hard data to kind of support that from from respondents as well. Uh, and what, what about from your side, Adam? What what do you kind of think might be influencing this? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a number of things at play. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, especially from the survey around uh, you know CISOs being more involved in the in the build out right of methodologies and strategy around threat hunting. And I can't remember exactly where I read the statistic, but I think as of today, like the majority of CISOs have been in their role for two years or less. So I think there's a lack of just experience, right? And, and they're trying to understand, well, how do I build it? Cause maybe they were a threat hunter from the technical side, but now you've got the strategic business side of it that you really have to deal with. But I also think, you know, in coming from the, you know, MSSP space, we're seeing a resurgence of that as well, where threat hunting is quote unquote, like added in as a service, right? Whatever that means, right? In terms of what an MSSP does. And if you think back to last year, I mean, it was a really pivotal point for cybersecurity where 
it's the first time we saw individuals going to jail, right? CISO is going to jail. So I think there's a lot of risk transference right now. One, because we're immature, right? We have immature organizations that don't have, you know, leadership that have been in those roles for very long. Not that they're not skilled and technically and have the background, but, you know, they, and, and there's risk transference. I don't want to go to jail if I'm a CISO, right? So let's transfer that to a third party or whether it's an MSP or some vendor that's that we can uh, transfer that risk to. So I, I think those things are really big at play uh, along with some of the, the other things that uh, both, both the other uh, presenters mentioned. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And it could also be um, part combinations of everything you've, you've kind of mentioned, like even, um, even with the concept of a lot of people using things like their like EDR or outsourcing EDR and XDR, it could also be that that vendor now knows the environment as well as what an internal person could be in. And so they're kind of giving that to a, a third party to do threat hunting and then partly because that is a, a financial benefit because maybe they're already paying for that service. So they'll just roll it in there. And then also I, I like the concept around kind of transferring risk as well. That's kind of a another one, which would be obviously extremely attractive to, to a lot of CISOs that are, that could, that could be very concerned. Uh, nice. I'll hand it back to Matt. Yeah. So there's one question I think that's very specific, uh, specifically directed you, Dave, and that is um, if you have um, any specific tools to use peak, I guess it's um, a little bit about documentation, setting that up. Is there anything? Yeah. So I guess one thing to, to know about, Peak is that we specifically designed it to not care about what tools or platforms or or anything, right? Um, first of all, I just wanted to avoid it being tied to a specific security product, right? But also, I know that like if I tied it to any tool, no matter how great that tool is, like the majority of people that would could benefit from peak would not have that tool. And so don't use tools. Uh, we do talk a little bit about classes of tools when we talk, especially when we talk about documentation. So um, I would say things like, you know, our, our act phase has a lot of things like how to document your hunts for your own hunt team's future use, things like putting it, uh, we put our, our codes in like GitHub repos so we could reuse it if we need it. We have wiki pages that document the hunts and stuff like that people use. Um, you might you might not be using the exact same tool set, but odds are very good that you have access to source code repository kind of stuff. You have access to shared knowledge bases. It might not be a wiki, maybe it's SharePoint or something like that. But so it's it's less about the tools. Um, like I'm a SANS instructor. So when we, like as you are, right? And, and when we talk about our class, one of the first things I say in the first day is like, I'm here to not to teach you tools. <laughs> tools are important to do things, but if you understand what you're supposed to be doing and why you're supposed to be doing it and when you're supposed to be doing it, you'll adapt to the tools. And I think it's the same in threat hunting. So um, we don't have anything to say about what tools you should or should not be using in peak, just sometimes mm -hmm. the classes of tools that we might recommend if you are not, you know, you don't have a uh, something already set up for that. That is actually a good lead over when it comes to understanding tools and everything. And that uh, question goes to Adam next. Um, so it's regarding AI and ML in tools. Do you see that being adopted in threat hunting a lot? And, and if so, how and is it successful? Yeah, uh, so good question. I Yes, we are starting to see that. Um, and actually, Hai has published a, a, a piece of a POC last year called Black Mamba. Um, AI polymorphic or AI generated polymorphic malware. So uh, I do think that one, the human is not going to go away, but uh, the threat hunting techniques and strategies are going to change. So one, it's first understanding what AI is actually doing. Um, so how is AI changing the game or how is it, um, how is it adapting to, you know, some of the new threats that it's generating or creating um, I think that'll change the way we threat hunt those specific types of threats. Uh, I still think it's pretty early on. And, you know, I, interestingly enough, right, you go to these conferences and everybody's got AI on their on their banner now, which 
Yeah, I think it's just the next buzzword, to be honest with you. Um, there's some really great research and um, innovation happening around AI, but I still think we're a little bit of a ways off in terms of um, we, you know, uh, we're seeing it kind of live. I mean, I mean, there's definitely a lot of of interesting aspects, but I do think it's going to change the way we we threat hunt, um, both programmatically and from the human element. Um, but you know, I there there's still so much in up in the air in terms of what a AI even means and the type of AI and whether it's you know uh, generative or not. So I think I think there's still a lot to be said there. But yes, we are starting to see that um, we aren't seeing a lot of it from our clients in terms of asking around you know about it, but more so from security researchers and practitioners and companies starting to do a lot more around what is it going to look like, how do we get in front of it. Uh, and then putting out POCs like like we did with Black Mamba, so that other researchers and other threat hunters can start to grasp, you know, their heads around what that might entail from a threat hunting perspective. Cool. Thank you very much, John. You got pretty much the last word after we wrap up. Sure. What's your take um, on the AI? I'll uh, I'll talk about the defender perspective here. Um, certainly, I'm concerned about offensive uses of these tools. In particular, I think phishing and 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 pretexting is going to get so much more dangerously better. But on the defender side, um, we actually have seen some experimentation across some of our customers with these tools. And one customer in particular kind of inspired us to actually build product capability into our product. But what this customer was doing is they were um, their team, their SOC was just out there experimenting with these new large language model tools that are out there and using them as kind of workflow acceleration, bouncing ideas off of them, right? And, and specifically, right, you can, you. I'll give you an example, right? Like uh, I was using some of these tools to experiment with them as well in, in the early days when they first came out. And you can, you can ask these tools something like, hey, I have a lot of DNS traffic. What are three different ways I could be being attacked on DNS right now? And these tools generally give you pretty good answers. Some of these tools can even go deeper and say, you can say, great, that second thing that you just told me about, how, what types of specific activities and behaviors would I be looking for for that type of a thing? It'll tell you. Some of these tools can even go a step further. And for well-documented tools like Splunk, for example, some of these tools are capable of like crafting Splunk queries for you that, you know, test them, check them, you know, don't put any sensitive company information into these tools. But um, that's a pretty cool thing because if you're a more junior analyst, you know, it's sort of like having a bit of a senior, more senior analyst sitting on your shoulder and, and saying like, Hey, look here, or here's how this would work, or here's an example. And it's, it can be really helpful for people in their learning journey. Check your sources, right? These things are capable of hallucinations, but um, a customer of ours was doing uh, things like that and talking to us about how their team was using it. And we were like, okay, we think maybe we could build a product capability around it. So we're definitely starting to see experimentation. It's exciting. That's, that's cool. And I think you're exactly right. Like any tool that helps us as defenders do our job faster and quicker, like that, that is a huge gain for us. Um, whether, whether it is things like threat hunting, being able to find those threats quicker inside the environment with threat hunting or just doing response type of work, like you're kind of describing there, being able to be able to like get ahead of the threat actor faster because they move through the environment faster. So we kind of have to move faster as well. And if there's things that will, will help us do that, like that's a huge benefit. Um, look, I, I want to do a big thank you to uh, to David, John, and Adam for for being here today and and to um, presenting and, and also um, being on the firing line of of the panel session at the end, uh, which is always wonderful. I, I know uh, it's always a little bit interesting to see what questions we get and kind of answering those off the cuff. But uh, thank you all all very much for that, uh, and for everyone else that joined today, I, I just want to thank you all as well for listening in and um, and please take the time to to go and read the full report. Matt and I put a, a lot of love and care into that report and, and tried to really pull out the as much of the metrics as we can from, from the survey results that people have sent in to us. And, and also those who actually provided results as part of the survey went, it went out as well. We are hugely beneficial to, to your information and everything you kind of provide in that overall survey because we take that and then we try to provide that back as useful as possible to the rest of the industry. Uh, so, so go and download, download that now. I know they've posted a, a number of links in the Zoom session and in the Slack room as well. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get a chance to, to answer today, uh, please feel free to drop them into Slack. Uh, it'd be great if, if it's directed at, at one particular person. Please uh, make sure you at mention them just so you grab their attention. I know there's a lot of questions in there. Other than that, we thank you all very much for dialing in and I'll hand it back to, to you, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Matt. Josh, 
David, John, and Adam for your great presentation, and to Carbon Black, Cisco, Corelight, Cyborg Security, Hyas, Lacework, Rapid7, and Splunk for sponsoring this webcast, which helps to bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.